Hi, I'm Doug Hayhoe, and I've written a series of short video essays and podcasts on science, faith, and other topics. Most of the videos relate to one of God's two books, Nature or Scripture. This video is called Time, Science, and Faith. Time is common but mysterious. We can look at it from both a science and a faith perspective. On my first trip to England, I made sure to visit Stonehenge. In his book, written in 1965, Stonehenge Decoded, the astronomer Gerald Hopkins had proposed a controversial idea. Stonehenge was a computer used by ancient peoples to predict future alignments of sun and moon, i.e. it was an eclipse predictor. So I just had to see it for myself. In subsequent years, I returned several times. There's a picture of me in 2009 at Stonehenge, maybe my third visit. Whether or not Stonehenge was an, eclipse, an ancient eclipse predictor, it caref kept careful track of the su sun and moon and their positions. From the beginning of history, people marked days, months, and years by the sun, moon, and stars. Sundials, which date back to 1500 BC, help people measure parts of a day. And water clocks, which date back to 600 BC, measure even smaller amounts of time, such as minutes and perhaps even seconds. The accurate measurement of time was critical to the scientific revolution many years later. Galileo used it to establish the acceleration of gravity common to all falling objects, which he wrote about in 1638 AD. Isaac Newton later used Galileo's results to formulate the theory of universal gravitation. When Galileo tried to measure the acceleration of gravity of falling objects, however, he found they fell too quickly to get good time measurements. So he slowed down their motion by rolling metal balls down an inclined slope, and he used water clocks to measure the different times. When I taught physics many years ago, we tried to replicate Galileo's experiments using water clocks like he did. The results were abysmal. More careful replications by others have yielded better results since. I later found out, however, that Galileo also used other devices to measure time, such as the Pulsi Logan, a pendulum-like clock. Another prominent figure of the scientific revolution was the Dutch physicist Christian Huygens. Among his many discoveries and inventions was the pendulum clock in 1656, 20 years after Galileo's experiments. This pendulum clock became the most used timepiece for several centuries and, in fact, is still used today. There you see a picture of it. Um, on the left, the pendulum clock of Huygens, and on the right, the inside working of it. And it's still used today because here's one in our own living room. Granddaddy or grandfather clock, we can call it. The high point of the scientific revolution was the publication of Newton's Principia in 1687. It was the greatest physics book ever written. You can see my essay, Isaac Newton. In a general scolium to the book, Newton gave his view of time. Relative time is measured in hours, days, and years, but absolute time flows at a constant rate through the universe and is unrelated to space or motion. This view dominated physics for 200 years. Many further inventions of clocks took place, but no major changes occurred in our understanding of time, until Albert Einstein came along, that is. I fell in love with physics in high school, but it was all classical physics. I couldn't wait for university where we also studied modern physics such as Einstein's theories. In 1905, Einstein shocked the world with his special theory of relativity. He said we should not think of space and time as two separate entities. Rather, we should consider space-time to be one four-dimensional entity that involves both space, x, y, and z coordinates, and time, t coordinates. So here's a picture of Einstein in 1921 at a lecture he gave in Vienna. Einstein also predicted that when someone travels at a very high speed, time for them slows down. Picture two twins. One stays home while the other goes on a long journey, moving at a speed near that of light. We're not quite there yet. When she gets back, the clock she took along only records that one year has passed, but the twin who stayed home, she has aged 50 years. 
Scientists tested this out in 1971 using atomic clocks. One set of clocks went into space orbiting Earth at high speed. Nothing like the speed of light, though. Another stayed behind. When they were reunited, the clocks from space were a tiny amount behind. But special relativity had already been universally accepted by then. In 1916, Einstein proposed his general theory. That was 15 years later. Time not only slows down when we're moving fast, it also slows down when we're in a gravitational field. This also has been proven scientifically. Einstein was still alive when Stephen Hawking was born. Hawking further elaborated on Einstein's theories. The general theory of relativity had predicted that the gravitational field at the center of a black hole is so severe nothing can escape. But in 1974, 20 or so years after Einstein had passed away, Hawking proved that black holes can still emit radiation. He also pointed out that from the perspective of an outside observer, a person falling into a black hole would appear to be frozen in time. In 1988, Hawking wrote his best-selling book, A Brief History of Time. In chapter 8 of that book, Hawking suggests that the universe may have no beginning or ending in time. Time and space only exist with the universe. Now, 16 centuries earlier, around 400 AD, St. Augustine had said something similar. Time didn't exist before the universe was created. You can see my essay, The Legacy of St. Augustine. Physicists and philosophers still have many unanswered questions about time today. Why does time only move in one direction, forward? Will time ever end? Is time just an illusion? If you're interested, you can find many YouTube videos and magazine articles, such as Scientific American or New Scientist, on these questions and others, written by respected physicists and philosophers. Now, let's look at faith, a faith perspective on time. Let's start with the Old Testament, Moses and the Prophets. People in the Bible, like others, use days, lunar cycles, constellations, and even sundials to mark time. But what was different about them was this. By faith, they grasped the truth revealed to them that an infinite personal God exists outside of time. Moses referred to him in several places as the eternal God. And Moses' famous poem on time begins by saying, Before you, the mountains were born, O God, or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. Moses also lamented the brevity of life with his unfulfilled dreams. He no doubt wrote Psalm 90 about time after seeing multitudes of Israelites die in the desert. Quote, you turn people back to dust, he complained to God. We are consumed by your anger. But even in this, Moses learned a lesson. Teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. Moses and other Old Testament people also believed that our brief life is more meaningful when we enjoy a relationship with the eternal God by faith. For God is not only an infinite God, but also a personal God who wants to be in relationship with us. Thus Moses ends Psalm 90 with this prayer, Satisfy us in the morning with your unfailing love, that we may sing for joy and be glad all our days. May the favor of the Lord our God rest on us, establish the work of our hands. New Testament Christians had the same three perspectives on time as the Israelites in the Old Testament. The eternal God is outside of time, human life is brief but meaningful, and we can enjoy a personal relationship with God in this life by faith. See, for example, Hebrews 11. There were glimpses in the Old Testament of eternal life for humans, it's true. The well-known Psalm 23, for example, concludes with this line, And I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. But these references were not always clear. When Jesus came, he taught clearly about eternal life and the resurrection. One day, for example, the Sadducees, Jewish leaders, challenged Jesus. They were rationalists. They didn't believe in the resurrection, but they did still follow the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, who had lived 2,000 years before. So Jesus reminded them of what happened to Moses in Exodus. Quote, in the account of the burning bush, Jesus said, even Moses showed that the dead rise, for he calls the Lord the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. Now, God is not the God of the dead, Jesus argued, 
but of the living. For to him all people are alive. In other words, although Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob had all died hundreds of years before Moses, they were still living. For the God whom they believed in is the God of the living, not the God of the dead. Now, this is profound. If we believe in the eternal God as our God, we will continue to live in relationship with him forever. For the infinite personal God is not the God of the dead, but the God of the living. Throughout the New Testament, the expression eternal life is used 44 times. Jesus and his apostles taught that God's intention is to give eternal life to all who believe in Christ. Now, the most well-known verse in the Bible, probably, is John 3.16. Jesus taught this to Nicodemus, the Jewish ruler who came to him one night. Jesus said to him, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. So there you see Jesus sitting on the right, talking to the Jewish Pharisee Nicodemus, who was worried about that. New Testament authors use two Greek words for time. Chronos, from which English words are derived, like chronology. It refers to the passage of time in days and years. Kairos, the second word, refers more to an opportune time or appointed time. For example, when Jesus' brothers asked Jesus why he wasn't going to the feast in Jerusalem, Jesus replied, My time, Kairos, has not yet come. Jesus used Kairos here because he was referring to Jesus' appointed time to go to Jerusalem to die on the cross for which he was appointed. Now here's an amazing sentence that came from some one of the books I read. The cross and the resurrection are at the center of a Christian understanding of time. They happen once for all and for all time. This is the center of eternity, the past eternity and the future eternity, the cross and the resurrection, the center of a Christian understanding of time. Now, it's only because of Jesus' death and resurrection that humans can receive the gift of eternal life. That's where that saying comes from. The cross and resurrection are at the center of a Christian understanding of time. The explanation of this actually would take a whole other essay. The ultimate answer then to the sad brevity of our human life is to believe in the eternal God who is outside of time, both God the Father and his Son, Jesus Christ. We will then receive a new life that is not bound by time, eternal life.